reactive training systems. So I get home on Monday and um, slept. And just kind of felt tired Monday and Tuesday and uh, and yesterday and today is Thursday. I'm finally feeling a little bit back to normal. But like as this is going on, I'm thinking like, man, I wonder how Josh felt. Like not only were you there for the whole four day event, you had a lot more going on, and it was the weeks and months leading up to that too. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you slept since Sunday. <laughs> Been a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, how, when when do you think you'll be uh, fully back up? Do you like do you have another meet in a week or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was hoping to be up and up and feeling normal by now, but it, I'm still working on it. But uh, our, the next one I'm running is not till uh, February, so I have plenty of time to recover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just barely. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, yeah, no, I'm feeling the same way. I'm feeling today. I'll probably have it. A little bit together but you know just kind of having to just jump back into real life is uh is tough because nobody else in real life cares about <laughs> we, can, we can talk about it but they don't they don't actually fully care um, right so you just got to keep moving yeah that's true um yeah so we're just kind of i just kind of wanted to chat with you about what your thoughts were on the meet and everything and uh I mean, what was the final? What was the final count? Like, as far as how many lifters went through over the weekend? Thousand sixty-three is the number that I was told. Okay. The final final number of who actually came. I mean, obviously, uh, that's an enormous number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and well, uh, yeah, that's uh, I don't know. It's just uh, a lot of people to go through over the over the weekend, you know. So, like, what was it? I don't know. I don't even really know quite what to ask because it's just such a uh, kind of a outside of normal uh, experience from a meat director standpoint. But what was it like? Uh, very stressful. <laughs> um, yeah. So we actually, uh, Joe Warpe and Angela Simons, um, the two technical secretaries, uh, Trey Cunningham, uh, Patrick Anderson, who was doing the play-by-play, um, the uh, uh, Matt Buttimer, he kind of did the uh, he, he put together a layout to scale. So when we set up, we could just show everybody this is where things go. Uh, basically, all of us that I just mentioned, we met uh, via uh, go to meeting, basically an online web conference, about once a week for about two months, um, about an hour or so at a time, uh, just trying to go through all the different possible scenarios, uh, things that would go wrong. Obviously things happened that we didn't account for, but we tried to do the best we could planning wise, uh, you know, to put out some of those fires as they happened, uh, with the, with the hope that people wouldn't, wouldn't notice. Um, <laughs> right, right. and I think, I think for the most part, uh, we did that, but there were some things, you know, obviously Thursday ran way later than expected. Um, and, you know, I, I apologize to everybody that, that had to be there for that and lifted the, you know, that was not the plan. Uh, but I think after, after Thursday, things ran a little smoother. We kind of got the bugs worked out. And, uh, and I think it all went, it went pretty well. What do you, what do you account for? I mean, I have my ideas cause I was, I was there for the whole time, but um, why, why did Thursday go so late? Well, um, I think the biggest factor was the number of volunteers and staff that we were able to get there uh, on Thursday. Um, you know, Contrary to popular belief, people actually have jobs outside of powerlifting. So a lot of the people that normally help, um, you know, they, they had to work Thursday and Friday. So, you know, if you looked at the platforms like our spotting and loading crew, for example, uh, most of the platforms on Thursday had three to four spotters versus the rest of the weekend. We had five with another, another five in the back, you know, resting, ready to come out and take their place. So, you know, by the end of that, I mean, that was a long day. You know, by the end, those spotters start getting tired. So my hat's off to Ohio State, uh, the ones that did most of the spotting and loading. They did, a, I think, a phenomenal job. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. So what do you have, like, some overall impressions? Like, I don't know, when, it, when everything was all over, were you, like, we pulled it off? Like, I, I don't know. What do you think? What was your, like, overall feeling on it? I'll be honest. Um, <clears throat> I'm just now starting to process, uh, basically. So Sunday night, uh, we actually had to uh, clear out the venue. So yeah. we had 
be out by Monday. So we were loading the truck until three thirty in the morning. Um, yeah. Uh, so after that, I turned my phone off. I haven't, and I'll be honest, it's Thursday. Nothing. Go ahead. Yeah, today's yeah. Thursday. So yeah, it's Thursday. I haven't yeah. really checked my email or answered my phone until I, I'm I'm turning it back on today. So I apologize. <laughs> email and things like that so I, i'm just now starting to process this but i think in general um i do think it went well i think uh you know i think more people thought it was done well than people sending complaints um you know they probably got that, you know weren't happy with something or you know and myself included there's things that i wish could have been done better um but i think overall uh, you know i'm happy with how it went and i think most people are as well yeah yeah i, I think from from talking to people, from being there for the entire time, I, I think overall the impression was positive. Obviously, there's choke points and there's there's issues that that had to be dealt with, but um, put it this way, no worse than any other any other giant meat, and probably a lot better than a lot of meats out there. I mean, we, you know, we keep learning, and, and and look, I've been talking to you since the beginning of this, and you know, just checking in once in a while, and. Um, I know how much you put into this. I mean, I think everybody knows how much you actually put into this. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's a lot. I know how much, how much it, it takes. So it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, definitely time to reflect on, on what you've done so far. Yeah. So and that's, that's why too, I like to, you know, well, I'd like to process things right away when it's fresh in my mind, but, I was so burnt out by the end. I just had to shut down. So now I'm, you know, trying to reach out to people that were actively a part of it and just kind of get their feedback and, you know, things like that too, because, you know, my goal is to get better as a meat director. So, you know, the status quo is not why I run meats, I guess. I've tried to do it better than before and, and, you know, continue to improve. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm curious. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the prime time setup and, um, I mean, I, I, I get it, like what, what we're trying to do, because there's always uh, kind of this conversation, at least with where Raw Nationals is right now. Like, do we want Raw Nationals to be like this big inclusive meat that has a thousand plus lifters, or should it be uh, only for top level, you know, elite athletes? And there's really great arguments to be made on both sides, you know, and I think, you know, anybody who's given it a, a fair shake can at least acknowledge that, you know, but I really thought it was a cool idea to try to, to have both, you know, like with the prime time setup, you can have a big meet and have all those lifters there. Uh, but you can also have, um, you know, one session that's, uh, that's the prime time meet, the prime time session that's more highlighted and, uh, where you place, you know, the, the higher level lifters, you know, I thought it was a really cool way to, to kind of do both. Um, after, you know, now after the fact, like, what are your thoughts on how the prime time went? Would you do it again? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I would. Um, and I, I think most people, uh, well, most people I've talked to anyway, they, they thought it was a cool idea after the fact. There was a lot of, a lot of pushback, I guess, uh, beforehand. Um, a lot of people are kind of against um, That's something that, uh, I really want to do is, is kind of Sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. There you go. Can you say that again? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it was one of those things, and the idea actually came from Patrick Anderson. Uh, uh -huh. You know, he said that they actually did that at the IPF Worlds years ago. I can't remember uh, what year it was, uh, but that's kind of where the idea came from. Um, and then we just kind of worked it from there, and, you know, it, it, it was a lot more work to put it together, I'll say that. But I think it kind of – it lets everybody kind of have their spotlight, you know, the ones that have kind of got to that top level. And I think that was kind of neat. So yeah, I yeah. would do it. Again. Yeah, I would do it again. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, you and I talked about it and I know that you talked to, you know, basically everybody uh, about it, you know, in the, the months beforehand, you know, when you were just starting the planning stages for that, you know, and um, I thought it was a cool idea. And after, now after the fact, I really think it was a cool idea um, because like I'm one of the people that's conflicted on it, you know, like what direction do we take raw nationals, you know? Um, 
like I think it's cool to have everybody there and um, also when you get a meet that size you get vendors that come in like the vendors that you had at, at your meet there were like like two full double rows of of people that had stuff that uh, you know just different things that were you know for power lifters that was stuff that you know power lifters would be interested in and I thought that that was neat you know you're not going to get that if you have 200 or 300 lifters at a meet. You know, it's just not worth it. Yeah. I mean, this was our first year uh, doing the booth, and it was way more work than I anticipated. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I think we learned a lot from it too. You know, and that's one thing. Like you're saying that you're still digesting the meat. Like we're still kind of digesting. You know, how did that work out for us? You know, what do we need to do next time to make it better and stuff like that as well. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a process, I guess, but see, I think that aspect of the meat was cool. And also it was nice for me to be able to, to sit and watch primetime sessions and, and participate in one of them. Um, you know, maybe, uh, not as well as I would have liked, but participate, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I thought it was a really cool thing. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you would do it again. Um, I, I hope it's kind of a, I hope it kind of becomes a thing, you know? Yeah. We'll have to see. I mean, it, like I said, it is a lot more work to kind of organize that and get it, you know, and, and, you know, obviously there was a lot of, uh, you know, I had a few emails like, Hey, I was the first one left out. You know, how did you, why did you select it that way? Um, uh, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, I think, I, I think we got it right. Um, based on the criteria we laid out, um, and, you know, it gives people something, you know, if that's something that happens in the future, then I think it gives people something to shoot for too. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. You know, like I heard not a lot because it's not like a, a well-established thing, but I, I did hear some conversation about that. You know, like there's the qualifying total to get there. And then, you know, some people are, are really uh, then trying to strive and achieve this, this prime time mark so that they can be in that session you know, maybe it's like uh, levels of qualification, you know, as, as you go up through the ranks. I, yeah, I thought it was a cool idea. What do you think, Polly? Because you kind of had to handle it more from the coaching end. Right. No, I, so, for instance, we had, um, you know, one of, the, one of the people that we handled was Monet Bland, and she, I think she was just on the other side of the cutoff. She missed it, but then she was able to work her way up into fifth place and actually unseat um you know, some of the people that were actually in prime time. Um, so it became, it was, it was interesting in that point. The only thing that, that makes it hard, you know, strictly from a coach's point of view, is trying to keep track of who's done, you know, where people sit in the open and then in the, in the regular lifting and then try to match that up with prime time and see how we do. But, I mean, logistically, I mean, it's just one of the things that we do as a coach. Um, I, I didn't I didn't have a problem with prime time um, at all. I mean I, I you know my personal opinion is I think that we need we we still need less people at the meet or we need to have less platforms going at once because I can tell you from a coach's point of view it's hard to to coach five different platforms and there were times where we'd have people on three different platforms and we'd have to be bouncing back and forth and they might start out synchronized but then they slip in synchronization. So then, then we're then we're literally jumping from one platform to the other platform just to watch the lifts, or we'd have to bring in a team that's two or three times the size, the coaching team. So I mean, logistic stuff that that you know we've been around long enough that we can handle it. But you know, do I want my life easier? Of course. So <laughs> it's but you know the question I have I have for you, Josh, is how many platforms are too many for a meet? Five. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, so my thing too is always like, I, I always want to highlight the top lifters. That's always been my thing. So even, even running two platforms in some, some cases, I feel it's too many um, for, for certain meets. So, you know, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if you can get the staff to run 10, yeah, you can do it, but that's still too many. You know, I think we did a, did a, pretty good job running five after Thursday, but you know, my opinion is that's still too many. I agree. Um, but that's what we had to do to accommodate that many lifters. So now, you know, it goes back to that, that question, you know, do we want a big meet or do we want, 
you know, just the top level lifters. And I think there is a balance and I'm not sure what that number is. Um, but all, you know, I, I would say that the number we had this year was, what was probably pushing that limit. I think of what's, what's big enough. In my yeah, opinion. Well, I mean, cause there's some, there's some growing pains with running that many platforms, you know, like I knew that, but it, for me at least, I'm not as, not as plugged into some of those things as you guys are. Um, so like when I went to the raw committee meeting and we started talking about specifics, like these are the problems, like, yeah, we're running five platforms, but these are the problems that come up with running that many pl platforms. It really, uh, put a finer point on it for me. And, and I go, Oh, okay. Like I, obviously there's logistic challenges, uh, with running a meet that big, but, uh, for me to be able to say, these are the specific things that, you know, that you miss out on with having a meet that big, that was, uh, uh, illuminating for me. Um, so yeah, that was, I don't know. I, I get it. And I, I think, okay, well maybe, uh, you know, even from the inclusive meet perspective, maybe, uh, 1200 registered is, is too many. Uh, but you know, if you could draw it down to 800 or 900, you know, that's still gigantic, you know, like it, it's ridiculous talking about numbers like this. Cause I remember, a few years ago having raw nationals in Orlando and there were 300, 350 lifters there and we're all running around going, can you believe how big this meat has gotten? Like, this is insane. You know? And, and now we talk about a meat that size almost as if it's too small, you know? And like I said, I'm not as plugged in on the meat director end of things. So, you know, my opinion doesn't carry a lot of weight there and it shouldn't. Uh, but it's, it was interesting to me to see like some of the more specific logistical problems that come up with a meet that size. And, and I'll be honest, we, we got kind of, you know, fortunate with that venue as well, because uh, we were actually in a, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys remember, we were actually scheduled to be in the, uh, a different hotel with a, uh, a large ballroom um, and they decided to do renovations. So they had to move us to this other facility. Um, so this wasn't the original facility, but, you know, anything smaller, I don't know would have worked. So, you know, from that aspect, we just kind of got lucky. And, and to, your, to your credit, Josh, I mean, it was the, the warm-up room was great. I mean, the, you know, just having the room to move around, having 15 racks, having having space for everybody. Um, I mean, prime time was almost like a luxury where, where okay. it seems like every lifter had their own rack yeah. for, uh, for warm-ups. And now, so now you've set a precedent, Josh, that <laughs> it has to be maintained where – you know, I, we want plaques, lifter plaques on each uh, on each rack for warm ups for uh, for prime time. But like but a having, little paper um, thing that says reserved on it. You know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But having enough room for people to mill around, having enough people to kind of just really interact and just have a good time, having room for people to queue up for uh, for weigh-ins. I mean, there was never that that worked really well. Even the flow going into the venue where there was registration and then you come through the, you know, you come through the next checkpoint and then you're in the venue and, you know, there, there's plenty of space to be, which, which is nice for a venue that size because it gives it a lot more of that collegial um, just group feeling that everybody wants to come together, okay. so many pictures and just so much, uh, um, so much interaction, which kind of just builds the entire powerlifting community. So that, that all worked really well. You know, one of the cool things I thought about this meet was, I had international, we had a bunch of international people show up like Kelly Branton and uh, Stephen Manuel, and they almost seemed like they were going to be really pumped about trying to show up to 2017 U.S. nationals, like, and actually compete. And it's interesting to, I think it's crazy that we're talking about it almost becoming an international meet at this point. Yeah, I know uh, Kelly was super psyched about, like, I mean, obviously psyched about the meet and, and it was fun to be there and everything, but his training after he got back home was just ridiculous. So I know that that, that gave him a lot of momentum and, and hopefully he's going to carry that going forward. But um, yeah, but it was cool to see. Cool to see. I agree with you though, Adam. I, I, it was neat to me to see these guys come in and just, I mean, basically come in because it's such a spectacle and such a, a thing to watch and, just be around you know uh, i think it speaks a lot to that it, it had the feel of a very small expo 
uh, for for a good part of the meet, especially on the weekend. Um, and I think the larger crowds that you draw to get that that star power uh, feel of, of where you're at is is going to be really big for the sport in years to come. Yeah, you know another thing that that I think helped a lot with that was the the live stream because there was a lot of effort. I mean, obviously a lot of effort that was put into that. And um, in my opinion, it was, it was really well done. I only got to watch the live streams for uh, the primetime sessions. So I'm not sure if it was different at all for, for the other sessions, but um, you know, those, the live stream for those sessions that I saw was, was really well done, really top notch stuff. Uh, and, and Josh, you know, on the on the other side of things, live stream. So feedback I got. Obviously, sometimes it's difficult to live stream and commentate on five platforms or four platforms. So I think that you know, speaking of what you're saying, also, Mike, that becomes an issue for a larger audience or for an audience at home to be able to try to keep track of five platforms or four platforms um, on a live stream, unless we've got unless it looks like the Brady Bunch. Um, <laughs> Where we've got we've got everything in there with different and you can plug into different channels, um, but I guess that's something that that we'd have to figure out if we keep going with this, or we have to figure out if we we extend the meet longer and we run, you know. But then that becomes I know that becomes a financial logistical issue with getting people to take a week off just to support. So it, it's it's um we're definitely we're definitely at a um at a turning point here, and I, I, there's definitely a lot to figure out. So what would you do about it, Josh? Like from, like, uh, let's say that that you got tagged again to to host uh, Raw Nationals. So yeah, yeah, I am throwing this on you right now, <laughs> two days after. So, so if you were gonna have to do it again, like, what would you like to see, uh, like organizationally, uh, done different in order for you to to pull it off, you know, just as well or better or or Anything. Probably more negative publicity. Like, don't tell me this date. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I think just, you know, the, the biggest thing, and I, I'll say this to everybody, I, I guess, the biggest thing is, is volunteers and support staff. Um, I was extremely lucky with the crew that I had, um, and I think that everybody that wants to see me continue successful their hat in the ring and help out um that's that's the biggest thing i can say i mean you know, it, it takes a lot of people i don't you know i think we had, volunteer wise i think we had up around 75 people that were that were not people you interacted with necessarily like people that were working weeks beforehand um getting scorecards ready uh you know printing a couple thousand pages of attempt cards and you know, just things like that that you don't think about that takes so much, so much uh, help. Uh, things like that. So I guess, I guess you, my my thing would be, you know, continuing to, to volunteer, you know, and have people help out. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You, um, with regard to like uh, drawing the numbers down at all, like, what do you think about? Uh, some of the proposals that get passed around the rock committee meeting and stuff like that. What are your opinions on that? Well, unfortunately I wasn't able to really tune into the rock committee meeting this year. I was running around trying to get all the, we had some technological difficulties getting things work, working on Wednesday. So um, I didn't really hear much of the stuff that was presented or talked about, but uh, you know, my personal opinion Again, this is just me. Um, I, I do think there needs to be a, a much higher or a much harder process to qualify, um, whether that be placing at regionals or a higher qualifying total. Um, just to, you know, because because I, I would like to highlight all the top lifters, you know, and that that includes the masters, the juniors, etc. And when you're running five plot five platforms, let's be honest, like you, some of that gets lost a little bit, um, yeah. you know. So yeah. that that's that's my personal opinion, but you know that doesn't mean it's right or wrong or whatever. But no, I mean that's that's what I was asking for. Just kind of what are your thoughts on it? I mean, you have a different perspective on it than anybody else is going to have right now. I mean, other than maybe Steve Mann, you know. So, uh, 
but yeah. And, and you know, my, my goal, I guess, after last year when they raised the qualifying totals, like I was, I was planning for about seven hundred to seven, seven hundred to eight hundred, uh, <laughs> being on the high side. Um, yeah, you know, I was, I was planning for more, but I was, I was really hoping for that number, right? Because I think that would to you know get things done quicker, you know, run four platforms every day, and then still start the prime time a little earlier. Um, I think it would have been a much more manageable, uh, I guess, enjoyable experience for everybody not being up till you know. Like I said, we got done with the awards every you know on the early days. The awards got done about eleven thirty, eleven forty-five at night, and that's you know that's too late. Yeah. But but that's you know in order to do that prime time, that's really the only thing we could do. Right. No, that I understand that. That makes sense. You yeah. um, know. I had another thing I wanted to ask you and. Paul, you can go ahead. Well, yeah, I'll just throw something out there, too, because obviously, you know, my position is um, chair of regionals. Um, I, you know, and, I, and, I, and I, I've, say, I've been saying this over and over again, and I'll, and I'll keep pushing this message. I, I really think that at some point, probably, and my guess will probably be in about two or three years, that regionals is the primary qualifier for raw nationals. So that, that we, we eliminate qualifying totals, we have a fixed number of spots that a meet director can depend on and that a meet director can plan for because then we can say X amount from each region goes in, we can count, we know that certain lifters with a certain Wilkes can be brought in and, and it becomes a, an easy predictable formula for a, um, for a meet director to plan for. And also it, it starts to really build excitement throughout the entire year. So my, the way that I'd like to see it in, a couple of years would be regionals first is the primary qualifier for raw nationals. And then maybe a year or two after that, you have to do a state meet to qualify for regionals to get to raw nationals. So it really becomes a full season of, um, of powerlifting. And these are, these are solely my ideas and I'll, I'll keep pushing them. But I, I think there's definitely some, um, you know, there's definitely, there's definitely some sentiment behind that. And I think as we keep going, we're going to need to put this in place. We just haven't had to in the, in the past. So um, we'll see some good changes coming up. I hope. You know, one thing that Bryce Lewis mentioned, um, he was talking, we were talking about the, the demographics of the people at the meet and how uh, for 75% of the people, this was, you know, their first nationals. They didn't compete last year at nationals. Um, so an interesting question that he brought up is like, why are those people here? You know, um, for people like me and, and Bryce and, and a lot of us, we're, we go every year, we've been going every year, and it's just kind of a thing that we do. Um, so we may be a little bit out of touch with those people who it's their first nationals or something like that. Um, so after he kind of posed that question, I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask some people. So uh, whenever I would come into contact with somebody who this was their first nationals, I would ask them like, why did you decide to come? And for a lot of people, what it boiled down to was they want to like, they are serious about it and they want to gain national experience or they qualified for nationals and you know, it was nearby enough and they decided I want to go. Um, but basically it seemed like because it was nationals, uh, that was that itself was a big draw, you know. So I don't know. It was just an, an interesting, um, interesting perspective. Now I talk to, you know, a handful of people. You know, when there's a thousand people there, there's statistically not representative. But but it, it was interesting. You know, it was I, yeah. Again, Bryce is the one that brought that up, and I thought, man, what a good idea. Like I don't know what's driving a lot of these people to make this decision. You know, they know that they're going to come and place 50th or something like that, you know. So what makes them decide to do this? And I don't know that, so ask. <laughs> Simple thing, but, um, yeah, it was it was interesting to me. You know, if I go back to 2014, I did my first Nationals, and I thought, I think I probably had a similar line of thinking was, you know, hey, look, it's Nationals. It's, uh, you know, it's probably a big meet. Should, should be good to get exposure and fun and, and do things that, you know, most other people can't say that they're doing like in any sport, really. Like how many people do you know that competed a national level? Um, right. You know, that's, that's something to, there's something to be said for that. Like you said, the draw of it being just nationals by itself. Yeah. So 
I want to switch gears a little bit before we totally run out of time. Josh, I, I saw you running around um, doing a little bit of coaching as well, or at least that's what it looked like. So you, you had a team there. You had people that were lifting under the, uh, under your banner, you know? So um, how were, how did that go? How were you managing that? Uh, just like what it looked like running around with my head cut off. <laughs> Basically, uh, I had a good crew there to kind of help out. Um, George and Donna Martz, they came in from uh, and then just kind of helped get everybody up. But yeah, we had uh, we had about twelve lifters lifting okay. over the course of the week. Uh, so you know, luckily, none of them were. We kind of got lucky. Uh, lucky ended up on the same platform, um, same fight a lot of the time. So. Uh, oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that, that is yeah. a coincidence because i actually mike zawalinski did all the flights and everything and they you know they all had basically the same class same qualifying code so that wasn't rigged but that's yeah. funny <laughs> the conspiracy theories begin yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so that made it easier but yeah from you know we you know it was uh we had a good crew there kind of helping out so i was just kind of more in the area to do with them i didn't worry about all that I see. Yeah. So a little bit easier to manage. I'm, I'm assuming that uh, they all performed about how you were expecting or. Yeah, yeah everybody did pretty well. Um, we had, you know, we had a couple lifters. It was their first nationals. So, I mean, nerves got to them a little bit. Um, but, you know, some of the ones that have, have been there before, they all did pretty well. I think uh, we had a couple nine for nines, um, you know, Anytime you can go nine for nine, that's a good day. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, speaking of performances, like I don't know that we could uh, in good conscience have a podcast about, you know, the 2016 Raw Nationals and not mention Ray Williams' performance. Right. <laughs> I mean, I mean the, and not to take away from any of the other fantastic performances, but, I mean, I do think that that was um, – I think Matt Gary said uh, historic, and I think that's a really good adjective for that. Um, yeah, I mean, Adam, you probably had uh, a better view than any of us for uh, for Ray's squat. Um, I don't know, did the earth shake? <laughs> yes, it did. It, it was <laughs> like, it, you know, I've been present. I've been really, really fortunate to be present for, like, pretty much the last three truly historic lifts, Ray's 965, Blaine's 500 kilo squat, and now this this uh, 1,000 pound squat, um, it was just as intense and like, I, I don't think, I, I think the crowd was loudest for this, for this one, louder than any other I've been at. And it was like a really emotional event, I think, for just about everybody in the room. It was crazy, I just, and what's more over is like, we're talking about his squat, but you know, Ray's deadlift has come a long way. And yeah, nice. I think pulling what he did, um, the three, uh, 375 kilo deadlift is just unreal. Oh no, I'm sorry, 383, 383 deadlift, just out of this world. I mean. Yeah, that was an American record. And if I'm uh, not mistaken, I think that was, I think that's the highest raw deadlift in in USA powerlifting, and maybe wider than that as well. Yeah, it was an un it was unofficial world record deadlift. Okay, so that, that might be the the highest raw deadlift in the IPF. I, I, again, don't quote me on that. I'd have to look that up. But well, so so <laughs> raw, yes. Uh, equipped, no. There's right. been some three three ninety five pulls. I know Brad Gillingham has pulled uh, four hundred. Um, yeah. Yeah. I talked to Ray a little bit afterwards, and, and I think for him on the horizon is a 400-kilo raw deadlift. So that's, that, that's coming. <laughs> I, I think that's coming. Man, he, you're right. I mean, the, the deadlift that is a thing that kind of got overshadowed by, by his squat, you know, but both of those lifts were just really out of this world. And, I mean, the, the total that he put up, um, and I don't even remember – what the number was. I remember after the meet's over, you know, I'm in the back uh, kind of collecting my things and I'm talking to Matt, you know, and 
you know, I didn't see most of uh, most of Ray's attempts. Well, hi, Mark. <laughs> hey, Mike. <laughs> well, I didn't see most of Ray's attempts, you know, but, uh, you know, but I'm talking to Matt and I, I asked him what he totaled. And so Matt, like, gets his calculator and adds it up. And it was 23 something. I don't remember the exact number. He just showed it to me and I, my jaw dropped. I was like, that's. Uh, 2379. I'm giving him a 0.2 pounds, but it is unreal total. Like, I can't even fathom it, really. It, it, I don't think anybody's really kind of it's really hit anybody yet just how big that is it's it's massive for a raw lifter to total almost 2400 that's incredible you know i was talking to somebody and josh i know that you remember this too but like if we go back some years i remember when when brian siders told 2400 2500 and, and 2600 right yeah, like I remember that whole thing. Like I remember even before he told 24, there was like all this discussion about like, is this possible? Now we're talking about equip lifting then too. You know, is this possible? Is this a within human capability? And then Brian comes in 24, 25, and 26 in pretty quick succession too, you know. So um, now we're talking about a raw lifter who's knocking on the door of 24. That's um, – I don't know. It's it's always fun to to like you were saying, Josh. See these talented lifters and just kind of see them get get the spotlight for a little while. That's that's really cool. Yeah, and speaking of Ray, the interesting thing with him is how humble he is about everything. Oh yeah. So uh, you know, we were tearing down the platform after the after Ray's session got done, and somebody's like, "Hey, you should have him sign the bar that he's you know the first thousand pound raw squat." I'm like, "Oh, that's a good idea." So we grabbed the bar and took it over there. Uh, and interrupted his interview with uh, on the live stream, and he signed it. And you know, he, he didn't ask any questions. He's like, "All right, sure." Signs it, you know, comes off. So you know, I'm thinking, like, what am I going to do with this thing? So my thought was, you know, we can auction not, not auction it off or something like that to you know help raise money for the national team or something like that. So I come over to Ray after the interview. And I'm like, "Hey, Ray, you know, we're thinking about you know, auctioning the the bar off to raise some money for the national team." Things like, "He's like, no, no, no." He's like. Let's, let's donate it to charity. Like, that's the you know, first thing he says. You know, I'm like, okay. You know, he's like, you know, St. Jude's uh, Children's Hospital. He's like, I like to work with them and stuff. So, like, I mean, no, no even thought of, hey, I can make money off this. Like, he wants to right. Work, you know, for charity. So, oh, that's, that's awesome. We're, we're trying to get going here. Get that, I want to get that bar up and, and get it online. Well, that's still fresh in everybody's mind. That's a great idea, too. That's a great idea. And I'm not even sure whose idea that was. It wasn't mine. Somebody just yelled it out, like, as we're tearing down. Right. No, I, that's, that's a great idea. I can think, like, if I had a, a gym, hell, I might put in a bid on it anyway. But <laughs> you know, <laughs> just put it up on the wall. That's yeah, you know, I mean, why not? <laughs> because we're working on having some atmosphere in the old basement. <laughs> so, no, that's that was a really cool thing. Um, yeah. Good idea too. I didn't know about that. Um, yeah, so that wasn't the the only uh, awesome performance. I just want to tell tell one more quick story, and we'll kind of wrap up and let you go. But um, the day that uh, the ninety three class was lifting, uh, the prime time session. So Dave Ricks was lifting in this session, and um, I always love telling stories about Dave just because they're they're so cool. But I we went out, had dinner, and came back to the meet. And uh, I just kind of came back into the meet, and uh, I ran into Dave in the bathroom. You know, hey Dave, how's it going? And he goes, oh good, good, good. Uh, you look like you just finished squatting. Yeah, I did. Well, how'd it go? Oh, uh, pretty good, pretty good. Well, Dave, what'd you squat? I uh, squatted three twenty. <laughs> pretty good that that's that's huge you know and, and he goes yeah that's pretty good that's a pr I'm like wait you mean like an all-time pr yeah yeah <laughs> like wait a second pretty good you just squatted an all-time pr you're 57 years old and squatted 320 kilos 705 pounds like i don't know it, it just kind of blew my mind for a minute i probably just stood there with my jaw dropped but yeah it, He's such a such a cool guy to talk to, you know. And a lot of those guys are him and Tony Harris and, and all those guys. Um, 
you know, how, how's it going? You feeling pretty good for this meet? Oh, man, I don't know. I guess we'll see, you know. And then they come in and just destroy people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I mean, that yeah, was- I, I saw uh, – I ran into Tony, I guess it was Saturday afternoon while I was lifting, whatever, in the hallway, and he's limping. I said, Tony, you all right? Man, I see you're limping. Yeah, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. You know, and then whatever, next – within 24 hours, he's out there squatting – 355, seven, 783. It's like yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> I know. Unbelievable. You just kind of shake your head there. And like I, I said, uh, you know, Dave and Tony too, they put a lot of pressure on guys like me because now I go like, man, I got to keep at this for another 20 years apparently. <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least 30 years. I know, right? Dave's <laughs> yeah, funny live in Atlanta so we actually trained together some when he was getting ready for his meets um and there'd be days you know he just walks in you know through the sky, and then about you know 10 minutes later he's already getting the first warm up squat like not you know, doesn't spend a lot of time doing anything else uh you know, there's been on multiple occasions come in uh you know warm up to 315 and it just looked terrible uh you go know, 405 and and literally miss it Spotters would catch it, <laughs> and then, oh yeah, this happened multiple times. And he's like, "Oh no, no, no! It's, it's put another plate on." Uh, so then he'd go four ninety five, grind it out, and then he'd put another plate on, and then do like a set of five with it. He's just like, he's just like, just getting going. So it's funny how you know he knows how to turn it on when he needs to turn it on, and maybe maybe he's a little late sometimes <laughs> turning it on with the warm ups, but. You know, just some of the things that he pulls off, like, is unbelievable. Uh, oh, yeah. I know. We, deadlift, like, you know, there's, you know, I was helping him at a meet one time. He missed his opener. Uh, I think it was the Arnold, actually. Uh, missed his opener. Um, and so, you know, he missed it. We went up anyway because, you know, we are trying to stay, you know, we stay in the lead. just went up a little bit. He missed it. And then he needed, like, a 20-kilo jump for the win. So I go, Dave, I go. And you can't do this with anybody else, hardly. Uh, Dave Ricks being Dave Ricks. So I'm like, Dave, you know, what do you want to do? He's like, oh, let's go for the win. Let's go for the win. So we put it on, and he pulls it. And it's easy. It's just like, Dave, why don't you start? <laughs> oh, man, that's um, crazy. You know, you what he does, so, though, crazy. I know. We, we have these conversations about, like, you know, when it comes to training – you know, you do it this way or that way. This is the best method or this method's better than that method. You need to wear these kind of shoes when you squat or, you know, all these different things. And then after a while, you kind of have to ask yourself, do I really know what I think I know? Because there's guys like Dave Ricks who, you know, like you said, miss your opener, increase the weight, miss your second, increase the weight, and then it works out for him, you know. But, 99% time you do not do that that's just you know. <laughs> uh, uh dan austin lifted at the uh masters worlds in atlanta in 2011 squatting in basketball shoes squatted a you know world record and squatted the, i can't remember what it was but just you know all those things that you think you know not to do well but then you know, guys like that just you know makes you re- question everything you know <laughs> I think we coined the term the Dave Ricks effect from this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, anyway, I guess that's – we've been taking up quite a bit of your time here, Josh, and I know that um, with you kind of getting back into things, you've got a lot going on. So uh, I appreciate you hanging out with us and chatting chatting with us about Raw Nationals, um, kind of debriefing everything i'm not quite sure how like you said you had your phone off i'm not quite sure how i snuck that message in there um yeah i I, I was turning it on every night just to kind of make sure there was nothing super urgent that That, that was that was the least amount of work Um, i'll go with that one (laughs) (laughs) all right yeah you know we'll take that we'll take that but uh, yeah man definitely thanks uh congratulations on I'm pulling off the the biggest meet in USA powerlifting history, and and you know, like we all said, I think it's really well done, um, especially considering the the challenges that you had to overcome. I thought it was great, I had a great time, and slept for three days when I got back home. So <laughs> that's double win. So. 
Um, before we go completely, I do want to say um, that on, let's see, it's on November 5th, I'm going to be heading up to uh, Regina, Saskatchewan. I'm going to do a seminar up there at, uh, at the Metal Gym. Uh, that's Tyler Harnett's gym. Um, we went up there last year for CPU Nationals, um, so we got to see the place and everything, recorded a video up there. I get to go back and uh, and do a seminar on November 5th. So uh, if anybody's listening and is interested in that, uh, contact Tyler and uh, see if you guys can still get in, still get tickets for that. But um, that's really the last thing that I wanted to mention before we let everybody go. Um, thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you guys next time. Reactive Training Systems. <laughs>